Great okay, so I let you the student, not Silver from New Mexico State University, and he will talk about intro to QCD and give us an intro to QCD and a small uh, and small. Very good. All right, uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, glad I was able to take Alberto up on this invitation at last. Uh, so I'm not 100% sure how straightforwardly it's going to go, but I wanted to try and give a blackboard talk uh, for the lectures that I'm giving here at the school. My personal philosophy is I would rather cover something in more depth to make sure you guys are actually getting it, even if it means that I have to sacrifice some of the scope that I would like to try to cover. So I'm going to try and make this work on the, the whiteboard here. Uh, I wanted to point out some resources for you guys. Uh, so if you go on Indico, uh, just in case you're not already familiar, uh, if you go to, oh, let me share screen. <coughs> Okay, uh, so just so that everybody's on the same page, if you go to the Indico page, uh, you can go to the detailed view if you're not already there. If you scroll down to the lectures, you'll see the lecture material. I've uploaded two files here. Uh, one of them is the PDF version of the lecture notes that I'm going to be going through on the board. Um, don't worry about following through all the stuff there, but if you miss something that I go through on the board, you can look it up in more detail there. Uh, I've got some figures that I'm going to be showing here on the screen. That's the figures file itself. So for the most part, uh, this is the kind of thing that I'll keep on the projector and then I'll just work on derivations and stuff on the whiteboard and then jump back and forth to make comments. So, uh, okay, without further ado, uh, I was asked to give the introduction to QCD and the introduction to small x physics, which are of course different things, but they fit together very naturally. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to sort of tell the story from the very beginning. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how well the timing is going to work, so we'll see whether what I think is one lecture actually turns out to be one lecture or if we have to renormalize the charge a little bit. So, uh, okay, without further ado, let's dive on in. Uh, when I first sat down to, to formulate what I wanted to say to you guys, the natural question that I wanted to begin with, of course, is what is QCD? Uh, of course, QCD is quantum chromodynamics. Uh, there's a very simple, precise way of stating exactly what QCD is. Uh, QCD is the non-abelian gauge theory of SU3. And uh, as I started trying to unpack that, I realized it was going to take me a whole lecture in and of itself just to explain what does that mean before we actually start getting into the nuts and bolts of Feynman rules and things that make QCD. So I think answering this question, what does this mean, is my goal for today. So uh, I wanted to start by sort of localizing us in the scope of theories, quantum field theories that we use to describe fundamental interactions in nature. Am I still screen sharing or not? Okay. So uh, just to orient ourselves, the language that we use to describe fundamental interactions of particles are relativistic quantum field theories. That is our best and or only way to marry together the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics with the uh, uh, Einstein relation that allows you to create mass from energy and vice versa. Uh, quantum field theories are fundamentally a multi-particle description of nature, and that's inevitable. It's necessary when you can have fluctuations in the energy that then can go into creating masses. So particle-antiparticle creation is a fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics plus relativity, and that's the part that quantum field theories solve elegantly. Uh, of quantum field theories, uh, the trivial ones we call free theories, but they play a really essential role in, uh, in, in the formulation of the interacting field theories. That's because the free theories effectively define what are our particles. Uh, so what do I mean by a free theory? Let me start there. Okay, so of our quantum field theories, the non-interacting or free theories, these are theories whose defining property is that their equation of motion is linear. And that's because these give you a linear superposition of independent solutions. Linear superposition principle. 
Oh, and by the way, um, please interrupt me at any point if I say something that's unclear, if I say something that's blatantly wrong, if you can't read my handwriting, I thrive off the dialogue. So please feel free to ask questions. That also goes for people online. So uh, for example, the familiar Klein-Gordon equation. The Klein-Gordon equation comes from the Lagrangian for a free scalar field, one half d mu phi d mu phi plus one half m squared phi squared. And this gives you the equation of motion, which is d mu d mu uh, plus m squared phi is equal to zero. Uh, why is this particularly interesting or special? This is a linear equation. So if I have two particles that are both solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation, they don't interact with each other. The solution containing two particles is identical to the solution of one particle plus the solution of the other particle. That's the definition of what we mean by a non-interactive theory. So the criteria for what are my particles are, what are all possible field theory Lagrangians I can write down? Uh, do I need to jump back and forth? Everything okay? Uh, you, you stop it sharing. Yes, okay. So the free theories define what are our particles. So we classify the Lagrangians based on what Lagrangians lead to linear equations of motion. Those are simple. Those are Lagrangians that are quadratic at most in the unknowns, which are the fields themselves. And so you can just start enumerating what are all possible Lagrangians that you can write down. Free scalar theory, free spinner theory, free vector theory. You can go on down the list. And this defines the particles based on essentially any possible representation of special relativity. The transformations of special relativity are encoded in the uh, symmetry group called the Lorentz group, and all possible solutions for that algebra describe all possible free particles. So that's sort of the boring part, but it's quite non-trivial to construct what are the allowed particles in nature. When I teach this in class, I tell my students, we have constrained God by writing this down. We have found out what are all possible structures that are consistent with special relativity and nothing else. So this is a complete basis with which to view the more, it, more interesting theories. The interacting theories, of course, include the ones we start off with, by cube theory, by fourth theory. Yukawa theory is a nice example, the effective theory of protons and neutrons interacting by pion exchange. Uh, there's quite a lot of non-trivial physics you can do in the interacting theories, but there's a very special, unique role played by gauge theories. And this is the part that I really want to unpack for you guys in detail today. Uh, what makes a gauge theory work? Why is it special? Uh, and the shining example that we have of a gauge theory is quantum electrodynamics. QED is the gauge theory of U1 gauge symmetry. And I want to unpack what that means for you guys, because this is our template then to try and understand what is different about QCD. There's essentially one change that changes the abelian gauge group U1 of QED into the non-abelian three by three matrix group of QCD. And that one tiny change in structures that are otherwise very similar changes everything about the physics of the theory. So uh, this is where I wanted to start. Okay, so uh, before I dive into QED itself, I want to talk a little bit about how we are going to use it, because most of the things that I have to say are based on perturbation theory, which is a good old tried and true method that works wonderfully for most quantum mechanical systems, uh, but it fails in some really essential ways when it comes to QCD. So there are some things that we will get right within perturbation theory, and there are some things that we will get very, very wrong. So before we start going down that rabbit hole, I want to be clear on the scope of what we can do. So uh, a few comments about perturbation theory. I'm going to have to figure out when to go back and forth. So of course, uh, we know the nice solutions for the linear theories. In general, you don't know the solutions for the complicated nonlinear theories, except in very special cases. So we need systematic approximation strategies, which allow you to approximate the solutions. And that's where perturbation theory really shines. 
Perturbation theory is a systematic approximation. And that systematic approximation means something important. It means that the error is controlled. So the shining example of this is you calculate some cross section in QED. And this thing is a function of the coupling constant. If you could, uh, if you could solve everything about QED directly, because you're just that smart, your answer would be a function of this coupling constant. The idea is that we don't have enough information to reconstruct the exact solution. But under the assumption that the coupling constant is much less than one, you can expand this in a Taylor series. So you get the cross section evaluated at, let's say, alpha equals zero. That's the zero order piece. And then you would have something alpha ENM to the first power times the cross section, uh, which is the first order cross section, and so on. This is all very simple textbook stuff. But the thing that underlies all of this is a very critical assumption. At the end of the day, what you're doing is essentially just a Taylor series expansion in your physical observables. That doesn't always work. And we run into exactly these instances where this Taylor series approximation fails. So this assumes a smooth expansion as a function of alpha EN or whatever your particular coupling constant is. And I wanted to point out a particular example where this is known to fail quite dramatically. Uh, the example that I want to point out has very little to do with nuclear physics. It's the BCS theory of superconductivity. So this can fail dramatically. So uh, BCS theory of superconductivity describes what happens when a normal metal undergoes the superconducting phase transition. And when you undergo that transition, there's a radical change in the degrees of freedom in the system. The normal metal is described by electrons that are moving through approximately three bands. But the, uh, the superconducting state is described by Cooper pairs. So the reason that I wanted to pick on BCS superconductivity is that it illustrates very clearly that you can have a phase transition that describes a radical realignment of your degrees of freedom that cannot be captured in perturbation theory. Radical realignment of degrees of freedom, by which I mean the electrons or effective electrons. These are electrons with an effective mass and an effective charge because they're not in vacuum, they're in the series. But these degrees of freedom get totally replaced by Cooper pairs. I think I've got enough space in the corner here. I don't want to go into a great detail about the BCS theory, but the example that I wanted to show you is the result from the binding energy. So this is the result for the uh, BCS mass gap equation. Uh, it's equivalent to specifying the binding energy of a Cooper pair. It is two times the divide frequency times the exponential e to the minus two divided by v naught times rho of ef, the density of states at the Fermi surface. Most of the structure here is not terribly important for what I want to tell you. The one thing that is particularly important for what I want to tell you is the functional dependence of this result on the strength of the interaction v naught. V naught is like the coupling constant. This is like alpha x. It tells you how strong the interaction is between two electrons that may or may not cause them to form a Cooper pair. If this is my exact solution, which some smart person could come up with, if I were doing perturbation theory, I would want to do a series expansion of this and try to construct it order by order in V naught. And as soon as you start trying to do that, you realize that there is a very big problem here. This function is of the form F of Z equals E to the minus one over Z. That kind of uh, behavior in the exponent is referred to as an essential singularity in mathematics. And that essential singularity breaks the series expansion in unrecoverable ways. So this is just a plot of that function. Here, I just take it and plot it along the real axis. Let me share screen. It's here. It's oh, sharing. it's still sharing. Oh, okay. You just did. 
Okay, thank you. So the uh, potential here is shown going from positive to negative values. Here on this side, it looks nice and smooth, not too much of a problem. If the coupling goes to zero, then the binding energy goes to zero and everybody's happy. Uh, but if you look just slightly from the other side, if the potential is just slightly negative, then this thing explodes in a crazy way. This shows that the approach to that singular point is sick. You get different answers depending on whether you come from the right or whether you come from the left. And the problem is even worse than that. If you regard this as an analytic type function in the complex plane, or I regard V naught as something that could be real or imaginary, I get a different answer for every direction you could possibly approach the point with. So the point is that this effect is a non perturbative effect. Why do I say non perturbative? Because if you try, you cannot find it. So suppose I take this expression and I try to do a series expansion in it. I would say E binding is approximately, then I would take the first term of the Taylor series. I would try to replace V with zero. And then I would get E to the minus infinity, which is zero. Professor, would you mind yes, wait one, one minute while they're sure. logging back into Zoom? Oh, no, no problem. Sorry, no. it's not being displayed right now. Just let me know when to go. Sure, it sorry about that. Such a nice yeah, sure, go ahead. I'll repeat the question once we're reconnected. Thank you so much. Sure. So you said that we can do the perturbative expansion and the coupling function to alpha is much less than you. Yes. So in this regime, is it much greater than? No, uh, not even necessarily. So even if this coupling is small, even if in this example, V naught is going to zero, that still doesn't work. There is no value of V naught small enough that will make this work. The function itself is fundamentally <laughs> sick. Exactly. And that means that this kind of physics will never be capturable with perturbation theory. Are we back? I'll say. Okay, so the question was, why does it fail? Does it fail if V naught is not small enough because usually perturbation theory works when your coupling is small? No, this is an even worse problem than that. This is a problem that no small enough V naught will ever solve. So if I try to expand this thing, the, the first order term in the Taylor series is zero or the zero order term is zero. Plus, now if I try to take a derivative and say, okay, fine, I've got my coupling, my coupling is V naught, I should take a derivative of the binding energy with respect to V naught evaluated V naught equals zero. Well, I take the derivative, I'm going to get some polynomial in front, but I'm still going to get that e to the minus infinity afterwards when I plug in V naught equals zero. So even the linear term in the Taylor series, this is still zero. And if I go to the next term in the Taylor series, this is also zero. And so you see what happens. If you try to take something of this form and reconstruct it perturbatively, you can't. You simply get zero to every order in perturbation. And I would turn this thing around and throw it back as a word to the wise. Often you will see theorems that are proved and written with capital letters in the field. And they say, I have proved to all orders in perturbation theory that this is true. Does that mean it's always true? No. Non perturbative effects can never be expanded in a series like this. So, a proof to all orders in perturbation theory is not the same thing as a proof to all accuracy in your exact theory. So, the point is that uh, perturbation theory is great. I'm a big fan of perturbation theory, but we should be aware of its limitations. There are some fundamental non perturbative effects that generally come in this form. There's a reason that this essential singularity shows up. To it shows up in the PCS theory for the superconducting phase transition. It shows up in QCD for the confinement phase transition. When you generate those uh, 1000 MeV worth of mass for the proton out of 10 MeV worth of light quarks. So um, non perturbative effects often have this form, and you can see very clearly why that fits. Now, uh, this is only one of the ways that perturbation theory can fail. Even when perturbation theory is working, it may not work the way that you expect. So uh, let me show you a particular example of something that you would uh, try to calculate perturbatively and it would start to work, but then stop working. Still sharing. All right. So uh, the second skeleton in the closet that we don't like to talk about that much 
is the fact that perturbations, uh, perturbation theory usually doesn't converge unless you're incredibly lucky. The perturbation series usually does not converge. And that's a problem. Normally, we like to pretend that these kind of things are convergent series, just like a geometric series, where you say, I calculate to NLO, and if that's not good enough, then I'll roll up the sleeves and calculate to NNLO, and if that's not good enough, then I'll hire a postdoc who will calculate to NNNLO, and so on and so forth. But that's not always going to help you, and that's something to keep in mind. So this is a simple example. Here's a toy integral, uh, an integral that you can do numerically without too much challenge. Uh, it's an integral from minus to plus infinity of an exponential. You have a nice Gaussian convergence factor, and then just something else to make it more interesting, a quartic term up in the exponent. This is something very nice where I can do a series expansion of the integrand if I want. Then I get a polynomial times a Gaussian, and then I can do the Gaussian integrals. So this is exactly a comparison between the exact numerical solution shown in black and various perturbative approximations to it shown in the different colors. And what you see is that, let's say I start at n equals two, so I guess that would be NLO. Uh, that's this dark red curve. And you see it does a relatively good job. Uh, it doesn't capture it very well when the coupling starts to get large, but you don't expect it to. And when the coupling is small, it fits beautifully. So then you roll up the sleeves and say, okay, let me go to an NLO, n equals three. And now you get this blue curve. And if you closely compare it, it is a little bit closer to the true answer. So if the coupling is small, yeah, it actually is getting better, although you probably had to work 10 times as hard for about a 1% improvement in accuracy. But the problem only gets worse from there. You see that as you go to higher and higher orders, four, five, even 10, the convergence slows down and even reverses. So as you go from third, uh, second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order, 10th order, the convergence completely breaks. And in fact, even if you could calculate a 10th order calculation, which don't try it, it's a trap, it wouldn't help you because the perturbation series itself is not convergent. So keep these things in mind as we try to do calculations in perturbation theory. It's a systematic way of organizing our approach to the quantum field theory, but it has severe limitations that we should never forget. Uh, questions so far? By the way, this is referred to as an asymptotic series. Uh, yes. I don't know enough to tell you like a, on a theorem basis whether it's guaranteed to happen like this. My understanding is that for most physical theories, they are asymptotic series and they don't converge. And only for specially engineered situations, do you actually have a nice little convergent series with a finite means of conversion? Uh, yes. Uh, this uh, picture for the high order thing, uh, only confirms the fact that we use a uh, payload series. Uh, we can use other expansion series like the uh, cherry cup uh, series or stuff like that. Hmm. So the question was, uh, if you did a different series expansion, maybe not a Taylor series, but something else, would you get better convergence? That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. It would be interesting to try. The Taylor series, although for the bad, this okay. Yeah. Where the chain of the monomial works really well. Yeah, it's interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if certain choices of the basis for the expansion work better than others. But I would be surprised if changing from a strict Taylor series to some other kind of series could change something from being asymptotic to being convergent. So you might get a greater, let's say, regime of convergence before it starts to go bad. But I would expect, just personally speculating, that changing from a Taylor series to something else would not fundamentally solve the problem. Yes, sir. And another, another thing, can it be that you expand not around lambda equals zero or B naught equals zero? Yep. Then you expand a little bit away and the thing changes. Can, can the yes. choice be a problem? Yes, uh, actually, and that sets me up beautifully for what we're going to talk about by the end of the week. Uh, some famous people in the field like to say that the small x physics or the effective theory of small x physics called the color glass condensate. Let me write this down. Uh, you'll see the abbreviation CGC it stands for color glass condensate. Uh, this is the effective theory of QCD at high energies and high densities. 
high, let me say, Mandelstam S for the energies and high rho for densities. Both of these things happen when you have low X, that is X Bjorken goes to zero. And we'll talk more about what this means in the next several lectures. Uh, so normally when we're doing perturbation theory, we do it as an alpha S expansion, starting with the free theory, starting with the vacuum. And we do perturbative corrections relative to the vacuum. The CGC effective theory is a different perturbative expansion, starting about a different initial condition. This one starts about the classical solution to the classical equations of motion, which are called the Yang Mills equations. And one does a perturbative expansion in those. But that's still perturbation theory. So when you hear things said in the literature, you sometimes you hear people say that the CGC describes non perturbative physics. And I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. You're doing perturbation theory. It's still the same assumption about a smooth uh, ability to expand your solution as a Taylor series, but you're starting about a different condition. It may be not simply related to the vacuum. In fact, it's related by a resummation of high order corrections from the vacuum, which is the next thing I want to talk about. But uh, I think it's still perturbation theory. Yes, sir. So you're using the perturbation series to find out something that you do not know. You don't know the exact solution. Right. In this example, you know the exact solution, hence you know how far you are actually straying off the path. That's right. In the actual scenario, we do not know what the exact solution is. How do you know we are straying off? Very good. Um, so you, the only way to do that is to compare what happens to your solution as you compute higher orders. So if you computed n equals two and you only knew the red curve, and then you went back the next year and you computed n equals three, you would say my solution is getting better. Uh, well, why? I guess. Maybe you have to calculate a few. Let's let's say you know, let's say I knew n equals one, two, and three. You want to compare the difference as you go one order higher. If I go from n equals one to n equals two and I see some difference, and then I go from two to three and I see a smaller difference, that's an indication the series is converging. Again, that's another thing to always keep in mind when you see comparisons of theory with data when they say LO prediction, NLO prediction, NNLO prediction. If the, if the distance between those curves isn't getting smaller, your series isn't converging. So that's a good point that you don't know what the solution is. The only thing you know is how are higher orders related to each other. And when you start seeing the higher orders not get smaller anymore, that's when you should start to really be worried that you're wasting your time. Okay, so uh, this was asymptotic series. I've talked about some of the ways that perturbation theory can fail. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm a little confused because I, I thought that earlier you said the higher orders you get, the worse your convergence gets. But yes. you said that if you said you go to higher orders, yeah, so what I mean is as you increase n, you see different behavior if n is small and you go up versus if n is large and you go up. So I'm talking about going n equals one to two to three, where hopefully you're still in that semi convergent region and not n equals 10, 15, 20, where you're in the badly divergent region. Does that make sense? Okay. But also, I guess for, for like lambda equals up to point two. Mm -hmm. N equals 10 would be a better approximation to do the exact solution than N equals three or four. Is that right? Uh, I don't know. I would have to really zoom in on what's going on here. It's not immediately obvious to me that it, and N equals 10 is a better description down here. Maybe it's not. Um, the other thing to notice is that the failure of the convergence happens earlier and earlier in the coupling. So maybe at N equals four, lambda 0 0.6 or lambda 0 0.5 was good enough for your perturbation. Now, if you try to push it to 10, the thing is breaking by 0.2. So small coupling gets harder and harder to achieve the higher you go, which is, again, perversely backwards from what one would like in a convergent series. OK, so I've talked about some of the ways that perturbation theory can fail. Let me talk about one of the most crucial ways that perturbation theory can succeed. Perturbation theory is sort of anchored to what degrees of freedom are you doing your expansion in? If I'm starting off with electrons, it's not going to be able to find the fact that my degrees of freedom might have changed to Cooper pairs. But it can describe the fact that my electrons might be changing as a function of scale, as a function of energy, as a function of density. It can describe a slow evolution in the degrees of freedom, but not a radical subtle. So this slow evolution of degrees of freedom goes by the name of resummation. And there are a couple of really critical examples that show up in QCD all the time. Both of them come from essentially the same ingredient, 
Suppose you have a single particle, let's call it a quark, and that it splits uh, and that it radiates a soft spore. We'll talk more about what this means. So let me just for the sake of concreteness, let me say this particle has energy P and uh, momentum zero, spatial momentum zero, uh, maybe in the transverse direction. Uh, say the gluon splits off and it carries some fraction Z of the energy. Z is just a dimensionless number between zero and one. And it has some transverse momentum caper. Then the uh, quark which recoils against it just has by momentum conservation one minus Z E negative caper. This is essentially the standard building block for both, pretty much all of your higher order corrections. Most everything in, in QCD can be boiled down to something built out of these light front wave functions themselves. So what can happen uh, in your series expansion is that a process like this is down by a factor of the coupling constant. Let me talk in QCD terms. So you might have weak coupling, alpha much less than one. That means the probability that this quark actually branches is very small. And the probability that it undergoes two branchings is so small you can ignore. But what you can have is an interesting competition. Suppose that I have this and now I integrate over these unobserved particles. I integrate over the phase space. Depending on exactly what observable you're looking at, you can get some particularly interesting integrals. You might get something which is small by a factor of alpha s, but then you integrate it, let's say, over the transverse momentum. That transverse momentum integral looks like this. You get a dk per squared. It's a two-dimensional integral over the transverse momentum. I get rid of the angles. Usually the angular integral is not terribly interesting. And this denominator, 1 over k per squared, is part of the result that you get when you calculate what that wave function looks like. This integral is very interesting because the form of this integral is integral dx over x, which, as any student of calculus will tell you, is going to give you a logarithm. This logarithm is then very sensitive to what those limits of the phase space are. So if the maximum transverse momentum is the energy coming in, I guess here I'm doing it in squares, the minimum transverse momentum is some cutoff. I'm just going to make up a name for it. Let's call it lambda. This integral being logarithmic gives me not only alpha s, but an associated logarithm of the energy compared to that cutoff scale. So this is an interesting competition. Alpha is small, but you may have a phase space which is large. If the energy E is really, really huge, and that cutoff lambda is really, really small. So pretend this is, let's say, square root s at the LHC. And pretend that this is, oh, I don't know, lambda QC is 1 G M or so. If there's a massive difference in orders of magnitude between these scales, then the logarithm between those two scales could actually be large. It could be so large that it starts to compete with the smallness of alpha s and screws up your perturbation series. So you could have alpha s much less than one, meaning your weak coupling is still valid, but a large logarithm, meaning E squared, much greater than lambda squared, not just bigger, but so big that it's exponentially bigger. The logarithm itself is much larger than one. That means E is not just a few factor of a few larger than lambda, it's exponentially larger than lambda. But if you go, you open up so much phase space that that large logarithm now starts to compete with the smallness of your coupling constant in a very systematic way. So on the face of it, this looks incredibly dangerous. You say, well, I had weak coupling, I had perturbation theory, but now I just killed it. But this large logarithm only comes from very specific places. It only comes from specific phase space integrals that have to integrate over a very large range. So this actually is a success story because you can identify what process generates that logarithm. And even in the case when alpha is small, but the log is large such that alpha times the log is not much less than one, right? In strict perturbation theory, I would say, who cares about the log? That's an alpha S correction, that should be small. But if the log is large enough, then this number can be order one and not small at all. This is still much larger than alpha S. Alpha S is still small, but alpha S times the log is not. When you have this situation, this is not small, you can't neglect it. That means that one factor coming from this kind of branching is of the same order as two of them. 
And that's of the same order as three of them. And that says the same order as all n of them for any n from zero to infinity. So you see, this is how the perturbation theory is breaking. It's breaking because each higher order correction, which is always associated with this law, is not small compared to the one that came before it. But if you can identify the source of those logarithms, then you can resum them. Typically, the strategy is, let me figure out the process that created this and write it like a differential equation. If I can write it as a differential equation, something like, derivative with respect to log e squared over lambda squared. That derivative will tell me the coefficient in front. You can write it as a differential equation. And if you're smart enough to solve that differential equation, that solution is the exact solution of the logarithmic problem here. This is referred to as a leading logarithmic resolution. Leading log resolution. So we'll talk more about this later. There are two extremely important examples of how this shows up, both of which come from this fundamental quantum branch. The one that I'm illustrating here is a large logarithm coming from the transverse splitting. This is essentially saying these guys recoiled so hard that they're back to back. These guys have so much relative momentum that I can ignore anything that came before it. That transverse momentum ordering of this type is what is responsible for d evolution. of P. And we'll talk more about what that means. Uh, the other type of logarithm that uh, gets resummed in the same way is the logarithm of this longitudinal variable C. If you do the same exercise here, you can get another logarithmic integral, which looks like alpha s integral dz over z. Again, the form of that wave function comes with a 1 over z that z being specific to the gluon. So in the limit when z is very small, that means that this gluon carries a very tiny fraction of the original incoming energy. This integral could be as large as one. This gluon could carry 100% of the energy. But if this thing starts going down to zero, it's gonna blow up. So you have to cut this thing off at some minimum scale, something like lambda squared divided by the energy square. This cut comes from the kinematics, it comes from the process, we'll discuss this more. But this kind of logarithm coming from the longitudinal integral is again alpha s log e squared over lambda squared. So this is the same kind of situation. Different logs, they come from different physics. This one is responsible for what's known as BFKL evolution. You'll also see words like BK or Jimwalk or God knows what else. There's a huge number of acronyms associated. But these things are coming from the evolution of the branch. And the fact that you can have many of these is telling you that this process, these evolution equations, which describe that, can describe a whole sequence of nested cascades of this order, as long as each one is kinematically ordered with respect to the previous one. So when you do this, you can use perturbation theory to push the limits of perturbation theory. Resummation is a way of starting with one set of degrees of freedom like expansion around the vacuum, and then performing this sum to effectively get a new summation, which starts with the classical uh, equations of motion. That's sort of where I'm going for later this week to talk about the FKL evolution and how that leads you to the high density regime and how that leads you to semi-classical regime. Okay, uh, this is a good point to pause. How am I doing on time and are there other questions so far? Yes, still 15 minutes, a little bit more 20. Okay, we'll see how much I can cover in 20 minutes. Okay, uh, this is going to take a bit to get to. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, my understanding is that you can still use perturbation theory here. You just kind of have to rewrite your expressions in a way that you don't have all of your. Yes, that's right. Can you explain again how the kind of the branched um, property that you're going to play with that? Oh, sure. Uh, basically, so this picture, let me talk about DLAP. DLAP was the one where I had some momentum here, but this splitting is huge compared to that one. Suppose I start off with some K per K1 here initially, where these are all transverse momentum. Uh, then I've got some branching here. This is K2. If my K2 is much, much larger than my K1, my K1 might as well have been zero, and then I'm exactly back to this situation. And I get this large logarithm from the back-to-back -back splitting. 
Now, if this one undergoes another splitting, K3, which is much larger than K2, then that also satisfies the same condition. This K2 is large compared to K1, but you can forget about it compared to K3. This one, when you integrate, you're going to get another alpha and another log. And as long as each splitting is much, much larger than the one that came before it, you will always get not only the alpha, but also the log. So that's the conclusion that this strongly ordered cascade, this has to satisfy K1, much less than K2, much less than K3, much less than on down the line. As long as you satisfy that strong ordering constraint, you guarantee that every time you integrate over another branching, you will pick up another log. So that strong, the, the set of terms that are unsuppressed are exactly these terms, the ones that are always counterbalanced by a small coupling, but a large phase. So it, it's possible to deal with this because only from this very systematic structured process do you get that break. And so if you identify where and how it happens, you can basically get the exact solution to that part of it and staple it together with a weak coupling expansion for the non logarithmic part. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yes, yes. So does that mean then you have to check that other uh, orderings don't give you more logs. Yes, absolutely. So it's absolutely critical to make sure that you have found the largest set of logarithms. Uh, for instance, if I'm working on all of this for polarized evolution, I might start calculating single logarithmic corrections of this type and then discover accidentally that there are double logarithmic contributions that show up where you have both of these effects at the same time. Those double logarithmic contributions are much more important than this. This would be down by one alpha those contributions would have two logs for every single factor of alpha. So you can even also take that a step further and say, well, what about NLO corrections to this? I could have alpha squared corrections. You could have this with just a simple quantum correction on top. And then you can do the whole schmear all over again, but now these things would have two powers of alpha. So there's a balancing act. There's a competition between how many powers of alpha do you have? How many logs do you get? And what is your resummation correct? The thing that defines this uniquely is the statement that alpha s log e squared over lambda squared is of order one. That's what defines the leading log resignation. But yes, one can improve and go beyond that. Okay. So in my remaining 10 or 15 minutes, I'd like to say a few words about gauge theories. So all of our gauge theories are predicated upon the best example that we have, which is QED. QED is the abelian gauge theory of U1, U1 symmetry. I would like to unpack those words to whatever extent I can in the time that we have and relate them to the Lagrangian that everyone has seen and worked with. Psi bar i d slash minus m psi minus one fourth f u nu f u nu minus e psi bar gamma mu psi a mu. I'm working under the assumption that pretty much everybody here has at least a passing familiarity with this. So if that's not the case, please let me know and I can do some more explaining. So the uh, QED Lagrangian, this is LQED, consists of three pieces. This is, of course, the free Dirac Lagrangian. This is the free photon Lagrangian. And this is the whole thing that we work so hard to get. This is the interactions for So uh, QED is a theory of fermions described by the spinner field psi and vector bosons A, which are referred to as the photons. And those vector bosons cause the entire source of difficulty with the gauge. So uh, psi is fine. That's good. You can construct all kinds of nice theories like Yukawa theory. But A mu is the tricky one. And the reason that A mu is tricky is because a vector in four dimensions has too many polarizations. You have a problem with the polarization states of the vector field. 
Uh, you also have polarizations for the spinners, but that's not a problem. You can have spin up, you can have spin down. The problem is that in four dimensions, you could have up to four different independent polarization vectors for the gauge field, the photon field. And one of those polarizations is deeply sick. You have no hope of ever quantizing. That problematic polarization is what I'll refer to as the scalar polarization. That's the one if a mu is proportional just to a perfect gradient. Uh, this is a perfectly allowed polarization in four dimensional space time. You could construct a field that satisfies this. The problem with this is that if you try to quantize it, it leads to negative norm states. This is just, it, it's a sick mode. It cannot be quantized, it has no place in quantum field. This is uh, also sometimes referred to as the time-like polarization. Negative norm states. So the problem with this is if you try to do it and then you calculate what is the absolute value of my photon field, you can get a negative number from this. And that's just not compatible with any quantum theory that you can come up with. So any theory that you have that has any vector boson has to get rid of that scalar polarization somehow. If you have a massive vector boson, then you can just forbid it by constraint. That's referred to as the Proctor theory. But if you have a massless vector, you can't get rid of it the same way. You have to get rid of it in a very different way. And that's exactly what QED accomplishes. The way that QED gets rid of these unphysical scalar polarizations is through gauge symmetry. It becomes a symmetry of the Lagrangian itself. And the symmetry that allows you to define the photon in a meaningful way is built by extending the symmetry that was already there in the free Dirac Lagrangian. So if I just start with the free Dirac Lagrangian, just non interacting fermions, psi bar i d slash minus n psi. It already has a nice symmetry that can become the basis for adding a photon later. This symmetry is a global U1 phase rotation. What do I mean by this? I mean specifically the transformation psi prime of x equals e to the i phi psi of x, where phi is a constant. Uh, why is this U1? U1 means the group of, let me call it one by one unitary matrices. And if you think about it for a second, you realize a one by one matrix is just a number and a one by one unitary number is just a complex space, just E to the I phi. So there is no actual matrix structure here, not a matrix. And that's very important. This is why the theory is abelian. Abelian is an algebra term. It's named after the mathematician Abel. It just means commutative. And the fact that this is just a number, just a scalar that has no matrix structure to it means obviously it's commutative. Scalar multiplication is commutative. That's the part that's going to change when we go to QCD. If I have a matrix that enters here, those matrices do not commute with each other. And that's the source of what's gonna fundamentally change the structure for QCD. So uh, this transformation, what does it do? It basically rotates the real and imaginary parts of your field. Uh, I could expand it out, it's in the notes. Let me maybe sketch a picture instead. If I write out psi of x in terms of its real and imaginary parts, then this is effectively changing the axes of those real and imaginary parts. So I can have the real part of psi, the imaginary part of psi. If my field is here, if I have psi, which has some value for the real part, some value for the imaginary part, then psi bar is the reflection about the imaginary axis. Psi bar would be down here. This is the complex conjugate. So uh, keep in mind, of course, that psi is the annihilation operator for a particle. This describes electrons. Psi bar is the annihilation operator for a positron. This describes antiparticles. 
particles. So having these axes that says a point up here is the particle, it's mirror down here is the antiparticle is a way of defining what my degrees of freedom are. Now, if I go and I rotate those axes, now I have, let's say, real part of psi here, imaginary part of psi here, then now this same psi is going to be reflected differently. It's going to reflect across the new imaginary axis. And your psi bar would be over here. So this transformation looks pretty innocuous, but it's doing something pretty substantive. You're redefining what is the particle and what is the antiparticle. And your Lagrangian doesn't care. It just knows I have some particles and I have some antiparticles, and I know how many more particles and <coughs> antiparticles I have. But it doesn't care which one is which, and it doesn't care exactly how you define it. So the meaning I would say, if I try to ascribe some physical interpretation of this, the meaning is that you are smoothly rotating particles into antiparticles. You are redefining what's the particle and what's the antiparticle. And because the Lagrangian is invariant under this symmetry, right, hopefully this is obvious, the Lagrangian is invariant because if I do this, then I just multiply psi by e to the i phi. I multiply psi bar by e to the minus i phi, and these guys just happily cancel each other. So the Lagrangian is trivially invariant under this u1 phase rotation. It doesn't care what you call the particles. But what it does know is that the net number of particles minus antiparticles is a conserved form. So this Lagrangian is a function of the field psi, the field psi bar, and the gradient d mu of psi. It does not depend on the derivative of psi bar. So if I just expand the transformation of my Lagrangian using chain, the variation in the Lagrangian is however much the Lagrangian changes as a function of psi times the variation of psi, plus the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to psi bar times the variation of psi bar plus the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the gradient d mu psi times the variation of the gradient d mu psi. And that's it. Now I can start plugging things in, but my equations of motion are gonna drastically simplify this for me. The equation of motion for this Lagrangian is of course the Dirac equation, which is simply i d slash minus m psi is equal to zero. So for instance, this term, if I take the derivative with respect to psi bar, that's gone. The thing that's left is zero, according to the Dirac equation. So this term is simply zero. You can also get this by the euler lagrange equations in an equivalent form. Uh, another way to rewrite this, if I reuse the euler lagrange equations, I can translate the derivative with respect to psi into the derivative with respect to a gradient. So from the Euler-Lagrange equations, this is equivalent to d mu of variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the gradient, d mu psi. And the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to swap the order of these two derivatives. This is a partial derivative in a particular space-time direction. This is a functional derivative that changes uh, the function by some amount. So if I just swap the order of these two things, then this is d mu of delta psi. And now if I put these two terms next to each other, this looks an awful lot like d mu of a times b plus a times d mu of b. And that's just product form. That is d mu of a times b. So the combination of all of these things looks like the total divergence of some function. So I get d mu of variation of the Lagrangian with respect to d mu psi uh, times delta psi. This is how much my Lagrangian changes, and I already know that it doesn't change. The variation is zero. So this tells me that there is some quantity which is a non-divergent current in four dimensions. This object is a conserved current. It doesn't diverge, so it satisfies a continuity equation. So this is frequently written d mu j mu is equal to zero with j mu is a conserved current. And if you actually calculate these derivatives, you get j mu is equal to psi bar gamma mu psi. And if you even expand these things out in terms of the free particle solutions, this is basically equal to the 
number current of particles minus antiparticles. Uh, of course, the existence of a conserved current is guaranteed on very general grounds by Nerker's theorem. So, okay, the free Dirac Lagrangian already has a global U1 invariance because it doesn't care what you call the particle, that's up to you. The physical consequence of that is conservation of electric charge, conservation of electric current. So that even if you don't know which one's the particle and which one's the antiparticle, you do know how many more of one than the other you have. Uh, time check? Zero? Like five minutes. Okay. We'll see what we can say. Please just cut me off when I'm out of time. Okay, okay. I raised my hand. Definitely going to renormalize my lecture plan. Okay. So where does the vector, uh, the vector field come in? The vector field comes in because you've got to find some way to get rid of that scalar polarization. And a conserved current is a really clever way to do it. So suppose I have an interaction with Rangian, just a simple piece, which is minus J mu A mu with A mu, a vector field of some kind. And this J mu is the conserved current, some conserved current, it doesn't even have to be that conserved current. The only thing that's really essential is that d mu j mu is equal to zero. If I have a Lagrangian of this type, this is extremely helpful. This is j dot a coupling, if you like, in four dimensions. Why is that good? Why is that helpful? Because this Lagrangian is insensitive to shifting a by a scalar mode. This, assaults, this solves the problem of the unphysical scalar mode of a because it reduces it to a symmetry transformation of the Lagrangian. So what do I mean? If I define a prime mu of x to be a mu of x plus a scalar polarized mode, d mu phi for some phi, then what does this do? My new Lagrangian L prime is minus j mu a prime mu, which is minus j mu a mu, that's the Lagrangian I started off with, plus the new term, minus j mu d mu phi. So this is my original Lagrangian. And this derivative doesn't talk to that current. In principle, I could reverse the order of these things using product rule. So I could write it as let's see, minus d mu of j mu phi. I have the term where the derivative acts on phi. I don't have the term where the derivative acts on j. But since this current is conserved, that's just zero. So effectively, as far as this derivative is concerned, that's a constant, and I can just pull the derivative right past it. When I do that, this is now uh, a total derivative. This does not affect the equations of motion at all. This is a boundary term, uh, which leaves the equations of motion invariant. So up to a total derivative, which is irrelevant for the actual physics, this Lagrangian, an interaction of this type, is invariant under the addition of a scalar polarized mode. So this very simple vertex, this J dot A that you've seen a million times since undergrad, is a very deep and profound thing because it makes it possible to eliminate the physical role of the scalar mode. Because if I shift A by a scalar mode, it has no physical consequences for an interaction of this type. That is what makes QED special. That's what makes it a gauge theory, and that's what makes the whole thing work. So maybe this is about where I'm gonna have to stop. There's a lot more that I have to say, I guess, next time about uh, how the transformations work and uh, sort of previewing what we're gonna see with QCD. But that's the point of writing the QED Lagrangian in this form. You have the original IV slash minus M uh, Dirac operator. You have a free photon field. And you have the very special vertex, psi bar gamma mu psi. This is just the conserved current J mu times A. So the point is the QED Lagrangian or any gauge here 
uses a vertex of this type. It's always of the form J mu A mu. And this is not just convenient, it's necessary, it is mandatory. You cannot have a photon without it. If I tried to just put some other photon in there, I put, I don't know, you put a term proportional to D mu A mu, or you put a term proportional to A mu A mu, or you put in other kinds of dependence on the vector field. Anything else that you add makes it susceptible to that stupid scalar polarization showing up and destroying your quantum theory. The only way to actually be able to do a quantum theory with these fields is with a coupling of that type. This is the minimal coupling. You can do more exotic things on top of it, but that's why this procedure goes by the name of minimal coupling. So I guess what I want to talk about next time then is what this does to the scalar polarization, how it gets rid of the scalar polarization, and how it combines together the Lorentz symmetries of space-time with the gauge symmetry of the vector field. These two things are now totally entangled with each other. This is a necessary and inevitable uh, feature of defining the photon at all. Right? You are combining space-time and the gauge dependence into a single manifold. And even though the space-time might be flat, your gauge structure could be totally crazy. So you can have curved space-time with a differential geometric interpretation, even though your space-time itself is flat. And the physics that this encodes, let me just end on the physics message. The physics that this encodes is the fact that in QED, the type of charge which generates that current, which comes from the symmetry is a scalar kind of charge. Electric charge comes in exactly two varieties, positive and negative, but it has no direction associated with it. As a result, the equations of motion, Maxwell's equations are linear equations. You have a beautiful superposition principle. You don't see weird things like electric fields scattering off each other. They add up just like they're supposed to. And the whole point that I'm walking through this for is to set us up for what happens when we go to QCD. In QCD, that one difference is the introduction of a direction into the gauge theory. The fact that there are now multiple independent axes of rotation and I could perform different kinds of gauge transformations and the theories on invariant under all of them. This transformation means that the, the symmetry, no longer, sorry, this symmetry group means that the transformations no longer commute with each other. And that means that these, uh, these vector bosons, the gluons, don't satisfy linear equations of motion. That change allows gluons to interact with themselves and with each other. And that one change leads to these beams now scattering off each other if I push the analogy. And this is responsible for all of the complexity of QCD. So, okay, uh, I should probably stop here and pick it up in the morning. But uh, the, per the point is to walk through the steps of what goes into QE QED and then QCD. I want to really explain what is the gauge theory of SU3 and how does it radically change everything that we thought we knew about QED. All right, thank you. Uh, we had a lot of questions during the discussion, but if there's any we didn't get to, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Okay. So we can start. If you have questions, let's go ahead. Sure. I think I had a quick one. When you say something like uh, SUN is the group of all n by n unitary matrices, are we really saying SUN has a fundamental representation where it has it's an n by n matrix? Okay. Yeah, so I, I always flub a little bit the difference between the capital SUN and the little SUN for the Lie algebra. All representations have the same Lie algebra. The defining representation, the big SUN, is the n by n unitary matrices of determinant one. But even with the with the algebra, though, the, like you say, the generators don't necessarily have to be the same uh, dimension. Just That's so right. there's the same number of generators. That's right. Yeah, so this is the defining representation of the group, and there can be higher spin representations of the same. So in terms of QCD, that means that you've got one representation of this, which is the quarks that have a three by three set of matrices. You've got a different representation for the gluons, which are the eight by eight representation. And if you start stacking together multiple quarks and multiple gluons, you can make even higher dimensional representations. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the talk. Sure. Um, so when you were talking about the U1 gauge trans uh, U1 EM gauge transformation, uh, it seems to me that it, it's describing sort of a continuous charge trans symmetry. Yes, um, absolutely. Versus the typical discrete charge symmetry yes. that we think about being reflection on the real axis. So is there a discrete symmetry or set of discrete symmetries which corresponds to that SU3 structure in the same way that we have the 
bearing on the real axis in SU in U1? Uh, I'd have to think about it to give you a more detailed answer. I think the answer is yes. I think that there are discrete subgroups. I think there are two of them that are simultaneously diagonalizable, but I would have to double check the details. Uh, yes, I agree with your description of QED. That's how I think about it as well. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes. This might be a big scale question, but I didn't quite understand what the scalar polarization is in my problem. Yeah, uh, I didn't want to get into something incredibly technical. It comes basically from the canonical commutation relations. The fact that you're in order to quantize the theory, you want to enforce commutators such that your commutator of a nu with its canonical momentum pi nu should be something proportional to the metric tensor g nu. So the problem is that the metric tensor is not positive definite. The space-like parts are positive, or this, or this, the three space-like parts all have one sign, but the time-like part has a different sign. So if you can make this work nicely in the space-like sector, it's not going to work nicely in the time-like sector. That minus sign from the metric is essentially what gets propagated through to that normalization of the photon state and can give you something negative. So you're sort of always in this tension between, I want something Lorentz invariant, I want G unit here, but I can't put the time like part because if I do, I break the quantum. And so you can choose either, well, maybe I sacrifice Lorentz invariance and I just quantize everything in uh, uh, Coulomb gauge, for instance. You can do that, but then you lose a lot of the virtues of the quantum field theory in the first place. Whereas unifying the two together into a single higher dimensional manifold that all transforms in an interrelated way means you don't have to sacrifice it. So you can, by making it a gauge symmetry, you can keep exact Lorentz symmetry as long as it's coupled together with the gauge structure. So the gauge, using a gauge, that's Yes, it solves the problem without requiring you to give up Lorentz and variance. Sure. Uh, yes. So, um... You know, maybe you wrote about the binding energy and its form, functional form. Now, is that the exact solution? Uh, I believe it is the exact solution to the BCS uh, gap equation. That itself, as far as I recall, is a mean field approximation in Hartree Fock theory. So it is exact in the sense that you wrote down a differential equation, that's the solution to the differential equation. It is not exact in the sense that that is everything that you could ever write down. But if it is exactly solvable, then why are you applying for that? To show an example where perturbation theory is known to break. And no, so in perturbation theory, you have an uh, unperturbed system and then you have the perturbation. Yes. Right? Now you know the solution to the unperturbed system. And this perturbation yes. essentially adds on corrections to it. Yes. But if you search, you start off at an EV, which is already given to you. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how the perturbation comes into that, if it's an exact thing. So the, the idea in perturbation theory, for field theory anyway, is you want to always start with the free non-interacting theories. Your, your, all your baseline should always be non-interacting particles that you know what they are. And the point is, there are some interactions between those particles that you could never construct between in perturbation theory. For instance, if you have something of the form e to the minus one over g, e to the minus one over alpha. That's exactly the form of the chiral condensate in QCD. It's exactly the form of the mass gap in BCS theory. It's a general structure. It shows up a lot of the time in non-perturbative effects. So I wanted to show an example of something where you knew the exact solution that had a non-perturbative effect in it. Uh, by the way, maybe it's worth mentioning, BCS theory cannot be solved perturbative. You have to do Hartree-Fock to find it in the first place. If you try to calculate the mass gap using Maxwell's equations, you'll just get zero. Right? You have to do something which starts with a different set of degrees of freedom and ask for itself consistently. You cannot get it from perturbation theory starting with electrons and holes. So I wanted to start with that sort of more concrete example to illustrate when one does perturbation theory in QCD, don't think you're getting the whole story, chiral condensate, phase, essentially a phase transition. When you have a serious phase transition like the confinement phase transition, perturbation theory is not going to be able to go across that singularity. And that's what that singularity looks like in another case. Okay, I would actually stop here because it's already past you know, five. <laughs> Thank you. Continue continue morning. Morning. Yeah, you can always uh, use Slack to ask questions. Yes, absolutely. And then, I mean, you're here, so just uh, I think. You're you're, but I invite the, the students that are uh, that are online just to just write on Slack if they have more sure. questions. So and let's stay here and, and sequester him for another hour, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, uh, but we're just to you, you call me and, and we'll bring him yeah. outside <laughs> to have uh, something to eat or so. Excellent. <laughs>